morning, everyone. I'm Caleb from Calaveras Big Tree State Park, and I'm with... <laughs> well, you're at Columbia State Historic There's Park. Columbia State Historic <laughs> Park, yep. I'm a little I'm dyslexic Lily. this morning. <laughs> That's all right. I'm Lily, and I'm actually at Calaveras Big Tree State Park. I just want to give a quick side note. I didn't have internet for the first, like, 20 minutes this morning. So there's a possibility I may drop out or at the very least I might be kind of pixely and I do apologize, but that's what happens when you're kind of out in a forested park. So just keep that in mind and be patient with us, but Caleb can keep the ball rolling if I do end up dropping out. I'm happy to see Exactly. <laughs> so what we're going to do first is Lily's got a cool little map to show you all where we are at. So you yeah. kind of get an idea of how close we are to each other and maybe where you are in relation to both parks. Yeah, so I'm sharing my screen right now. I'm showing the Google map. And this webinar is the cost of gold, environmental impacts of the gold rush. So I, at Calvary's Big Tree State Park, this is me, I'm the little briefcase right there. I'm not necessarily where the gold miners were hunting for gold, but if I zoom out, not too much, you can still see a little briefcase. I keep zooming. Oh, there's Columbia down there. And Columbia is where the gold miners are really hunting for gold. And as you can see, now the briefcase has become a heart. I have them both saved a place I like and a place I work. As you can see, we're pretty close to each other. It takes like about 40 minutes, 30 minutes, depends on you know how fast you're going, to get between our two parks if you're driving. So we're pretty close to each other, therefore we've had lots of overlap in terms of impacts from people. Gold rush and kind of like ripple effects from the gold rush. And I'm gonna zoom us out a little bit more so you can kind of get a sense for where we are within the whole state. So you said Sacramento, you see San Francisco, you can also see here is the border of Nevada. So we're both kind of in the foothills of Sierra Nevadas. I'm higher up, as you might have been able to tell, because I'm shockingly wearing long sleeves today, but we're still, you know, relatively close to the mountains. And now awesome. I'm gonna let Caleb take it from there. All right, so what we are going to explore today, like Lily said, is the environmental effects of the California gold rush. We call that the cost for gold. Give me just a half second to fix my screen here. Here we go. Perfect. So just a little bit of background. Now, the California gold rush brought 300,000 people to the state of California. And the gold rush officially lasted from 1848 till about 1856. From what we can tell before the gold rush, there's ever between 100,000 to maybe 300,000 Native Americans. So in an area that was sparsely populated over the period of the gold rush, our population at the very least doubled, if not tripled. So the population here exploded. And all of these people, they came here to hunt for gold. They wanted to get rich quick and hopefully go home. And because they came with that mentality, they didn't necessarily care so much what they did to the environment when they got here. And we're going to look at our first environmental effect here. And that would be these exposed rocks right here. So I'm standing up on this hillside. And for those of you that have been here before, you're probably familiar with this little location right here in Columbia. And I'll just give you a quick spin around so everyone can kind of orient themselves. But those rocks, they used to be under 20 feet of dirt. Our gold miners, the placer miners here in Colombia, came through this little spot here searching for gold. So I'm walking down the hill now. I'm going to go into these rocks. And if this was before the gold rush, before Colombia had been discovered, I'd be standing underground right now. And they had to move all of this dirt, mostly with water, searching for the gold here. And all of that dirt, well, it had to go somewhere. Well, it's not here anymore. And that somewhere was downriver, downstream. And into the central valley of California. And that's an important area too, because that turned 
into an agriculture area. I'm gonna set my tripod here. So that's where most of our crops were grown later on. So as the gold rush continued, more and more sediment. So we call that dirt moving downstream just piled up in the Central Valley. And that eventually caused floods in those farmlands. And the farmlands that we have today, they currently produce about two thirds of our country's nuts and fruits. So you can just imagine this area that started to boom with agriculture, all of those crops and animals they were raising, how devastating those floods would be for those farmlands. And the most devastating form of gold mining for sending all that sediment down river was hydraulic mining. And I'm gonna show you all a picture of that. And my screen's gonna kind of turn sideways because I am on an iPhone. So uh, bear with me for just a second as I go grab those pictures. So here, we see some hydraulic mining and that required a lot of water. And you can see all they're doing is just spraying that hillside. They're eroding it away with the water. And again, all of that dirt, that muddy water had to flow somewhere. And that was straight through the Central Valley of California. And that dirt would eventually end up in our Delta, the area around Sacramento and into the ocean. Now, because of these massive floods, especially by the hydraulic mining, that caused a law to get passed in 1884 to ban hydraulic mining because of the massive amount of floods. And did we We are some doing results the poll, from our poll? And I'm going awesome. to go ahead and end it and share it. Awesome. So it looks like 60% of you said yes, that Columbia had a natural water supply and 40% of you said no. Well, Columbia didn't have a natural supply of water. We don't have a river, a lake, or a stream, or a, um, a big stream here. We had kind of a small little creek that was seasonal. But because we lacked a natural supply of water, one had to be dug here. And that is our next environmental effect. So the water that we got specifically here in Columbia was dug with 60 miles of ditches and flumes from the south fork of the Stanislaus River. And eventually we had almost 25,000 people here in Colombia. Our city exploded. So more and more mining, they needed lots and lots of water. So they decided to dam up an area. And this area was originally called Strawberry Flat. And I bet a lot of you are familiar with it because the name that this area is known by today is Pinecrest Lake. It was originally constructed in 1856 with the purpose to give water just to Columbia for our gold miners. And historically, that meadow is called Strawberry Flat because there was wild strawberry plants everywhere. It was used by the native Miwok people. They would collect the strawberries. They also had some grinding rocks there. And as a result of the gold miners building that dam, it displaced the Miwok people. They had to move someplace else to find more of their strawberries or in other locations where there were grinding rocks. And that was not uncommon for gold mining areas for the Native Americans to get displaced. But that dam was the, the first of many. Dams popped up all over California just so the miners could store that water and have enough water to do their plaster mining or their hydraulic mining. And the mining here, the plaster mining, I'm sure most of you are familiar with like a gold pan and they had other tools. The idea with these other tools with sluice boxes and rocker boxes is like a gigantic gold pan. You pile the dirt on top of it, you have a motion that agitates or shakes the dirt back and forth and you run water over it. And they would use the water because gold is 17 times heavier than water. But they would also use another chemical to help them find that gold. And that chemical was called quicksilver. And I'm going to launch another poll because I want to see 
if you can guess what Quicksilver is. So we have three choices. Is it sodium cyanide, dihydrogen monoxide, or mercury? So go ahead and tell me what you think Quicksilver is. And I'll give you all about to the 40 second mark. Okay, 10 more seconds for a little poll here. To guess what is Quicksilver? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And I'm gonna share the results here. So everybody answered correctly. Quicksilver was the name that they gave to mercury. Now those other chemicals, dihydrogen monoxide is water, which they did use and sodium cyanide is used in gold mining operations today in the same way that mercury was during the California gold rush. Now mercury would attach itself to the gold, which would make it easier for our gold miners to find it. The problem with that though, is mercury is kind of toxic to people. And during the gold rush, the mercury mines in the California Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, specifically near the city of San Jose, sent up 13,000 tons of mercury into the foothills here. And of those 13,000 tons, roughly 38% or 5,000 tons leached back into the environment. They traveled the same way that all of that sediment that I told you about earlier. Those 5,000 tons were carried through the waterways and down into the Central Valley. And we can still feel that effect today. And we will probably forever feel that effect because mercury doesn't leave the environment. It just moves a little bit. And mercury poisoning, especially chronic mercury poisoning, they used to call it Mad Hatter's disease. A person would exhibit slurred speech, depression. They kind of start going crazy speaking strangely. And they knew this because Mad Hatter's disease showed up about 30 years before the California gold rush. They called it Mad Hatter's disease because they used to, when they made hats out of fur, they would use the mercury to help them shape it. And the people that made those hats would eventually get mercury poisoning. So they were pretty aware of the dangers of mercury. They just decided to continue using it to help find that gold. And the easiest way that you can find where gold mining occurred today is to look for warnings about consuming fish in our waterways. There'll be mercury content warnings. And that means that gold mining either occurred at that location or just a little bit upstream. Now we're gonna look at the next impact. And that has to come with the, or comes from the large amount of Eat, right? And California's industries at the start of the gold rush were non existent. There wasn't any farms yet. That happened later on. And most of the miners had to import their food. Now they get very expensive. So, what they started to do is hire people called trappers who would go and hunt some of the wildlife around here for food for our miners. And there was one really large animal that they went after, and that was the California grizzly bear. And give me just a second. And I'm going to show you a picture of one. So this right here is a taxidermy golden bear. Before the gold rush, the estimates were that there were around 10,000 of these grizzly bears in California. There were so many bears here that we were originally called the bear state or the bear republic. And these are very large animals, over a thousand pounds, which was why those trappers would look for these big grizzly bears because it's a thousand pounds of meat. You could feed a lot of people with that. The problem was they over hunted them. And they also viewed them as dangerous. So they hunted them to extinction. The last one was killed in 1922. 
Now, speaking of dangerous animals, there was another animal that was hunted to extinction during the gold rush. And that is the gray wolf. There used to be wolves all over California as well, but they were also viewed as a danger. So the miners tended to shoot them. And just to kind of give you a size comparison too, this is a picture of a husky next to a gray wolf. So you can get a sense of just how large these creatures are. And the last gray wolf was hunted to extinction in the 1920s. Now we do have some in California now, but they came from a wolf pack in Oregon. Now the next animal that was nearly hunted to extinction, just barely survived, that was also overhunted for food, was the Thule elk. And this elk is kind of around the San Luis Reservoir and other coastal areas. Nearly hunted to extinction, we're trying to protect them today so their populations can increase. And to give you an idea of the hunting habits they had back then, there was a newspaper article from the St uh, newspaper in Stockton in 1868 that had a little story about a man who hunted antelope. And he, in one day, killed somewhere around 16 different antelope. So that tended to be what a lot of those gold miners and the trappers were doing then which devastated a lot of these species. Now, the last effect that we're gonna look at here is over logging. So we had a lot of our trees cut down. We can see some today. I'll even flip my camera around so you can see a few of our little oak trees that have regrown. But even here in Colombia, they would cut these all down and they would use them for building houses. But unfortunately, fire being a natural part of California's ecosystem, these gold mining towns, not just Columbia, but most of them would burn down multiple times. So they had to keep rebuilding. Most of them used wood. That's one reason why they overlogged. And they devastated California's coastal redwood population, roughly 94%. But it wasn't just for housing that they would cut down trees, because our companies were always seeking ways here to make more money. And Lily is going to tell you more about that. Yeah, thanks, Caleb. So coastal redwoods, they got absolutely decimated from logging. And at my park, I don't have coastal redwoods. I'm at Calaveras Big Trees State Park. So we do have the biggest individual tree in the world, not the coast redwood, but its cousin, the giant sequoia. And we actually have evidence right here of a giant sequoia that was cut down. So I'm going to launch another poll here. And I want to get your opinion, get your thoughts for why you think this tree was cut down. I will tell you, this tree was cut down a while ago. Cut down in 1853. Now I'll give you all another about 20 seconds to vote. And then I'll end the poll and share the results. All right, another five seconds. Go ahead and make a vote if you want to see. And I'll end it and share it. And it looks like majority of you said money from exhibitions. You are correct. And the one of you said just because, and in a way, it was kind of just because. So I'll give you a little bit for that. But I like to throw that option in there because honestly, you'll see, especially if we're talking like 1800s, early 1900s, a little bit 1700s as well, some bad things were done to the environment that were in a way just to prove the might of humanity, you could argue. But I wanna talk a little bit about why this wasn't cut down necessarily for logging. Cause it's cousin, the Coast Redwood was 95% of coast redwoods were used, cut down, and 
pain because of both have similar properties. Both pain and tan and helps keep the tree from getting disease very well throughout the cold, throughout the wet, throughout any sort of things that might kind of eventually destroy your home. They're also quite huge trees, right? That's very appealing for building. But that's actually one of the reasons why the giant sequoia wasn't necessarily cut and the coast redwood was. The giant sequoias are too big to cut in the 1800s. I mentioned that this is the largest individual tree in the world. By large, I mean they're both tall. They can be up to 300 feet, but most especially they're big across. So I'm taking a top of the stump here and I'm going to walk to one end of the stump and kind of walk around to give you an idea for just how big these trees can get. So this stump was called the Discovery Stump and it was the biggest tree in this park. I shouldn't say a park, it wasn't a park at the time. It was the biggest tree in this grove in you know the 1850s. Right now it's about 25 feet across. Its bark has been stripped from it and the bark can be quite thick. So it might've been 30 feet across. We're not entirely sure how tall it was, maybe 270, maybe 300 feet tall. That wasn't really recorded. But because the width was so much, it was really hard to get any sort of saws through it back then. And actually you can see how they cut it down by taking a closer look at what remains of the rest of the trunk. So you can see there's these long holes in there. They use something called pump augers to basically punch these giant long holes through this tree. And it took three weeks of punching these long holes through the tree till finally the tree got weak enough that it fell down. Now, it's hard to cut down a tree like this using this method, right? So that was one deterrent to use this tree for logging. They were also so heavy that they often, when they fell, they would shatter into little pieces. Not very helpful if you want to build a building. And there's one other thing, and that's simply the location. So I already showed you on the Google Maps where I am versus where Caleb is, but now I'm going to share a map made by the Save the Redwoods League. And you can see the range of the giant sequoia and the range of the coast redwood. So this kind of bright orange color here, that's coast redwood, you can see, makes sense. It's along the coast. The coast can be rugged in California, but it's nowhere near as difficult to get to or difficult to take something out of as the foothills of Sierra Nevada, which is along here. That's where the giant sequoia lives. The bright lime green circle already there is where I am now. It's so hard to access these trees and bring them out that that was another reason why they weren't logged at least as much as the coast redwood. Both trees have their claims to fame. The coast redwood's the tallest, but because of their accessibility and because of how much easier they were to use and that rot resistance, they were used a lot for building. And the giant sequoia was not. So already established. This was not cut down for logging. This was cut down for exhibitions. In 1853, when those new settlers from the gold rush came up here. They were actually coming up here to look for that water. The person who was here specifically and stumbled across this tree and brought the tree to international and national fame was here to hunt for the folks who are trying to get water to Columbia. So it's all connected. And after finding this tree and saying, hey everyone, this is a ginormous tree, you should all take a look people started thinking almost immediately about how they can make money from this tree. Well, if you have a tree that's big and it's 1853, it's hard to get people to come here. So let's bring the tree to the people. So this tree was cut down, as I said before, and it was, chunks of it were shipped all over the world to show off these really cool trees in California and maybe make some money from it. So this flyer right here, you can see it is dated 1854. So just one year later, talks about an exhibition in New York to see the great tree. And eventually this stump actually became its own draw. Hotels were built around it and it became a dance floor of sorts. It was very popular for people to come, be on top of the stump, gather, etc. Just like it is now. 
there was actually just some people on the scent before it came over here. So we pretty much have a nonstop cycle of people coming through to see on top of this stump. Now we did have one other tree that was damaged from basically tourism. And that's the mother of the forest. I'm getting off this stump here. So in case we do have more people coming along, I'm not monopolizing the space. But I do wanna share with you a picture of the mother of the forest. It was again, the same sort of idea where it's like, okay, we want to show off these trees to people who aren't here. What's the best way for us to do that? And for the mother forest, instead of cutting her down, they instead stripped the bark away from here. This was in 1854. You can see with all the scaffolding, they use the scaffolding to go up to top the tree, peel away chunks of the bark, and they label the chunks such that they could reassemble it like a puzzle piece and show it off in places like, again, San Francisco, New York, also London. This is the palace, or this is the tree at the Crystal Palace. You can see it's been reassembled. And they did make a fair amount of money off of this tree. Ironically though, this tree ended up, or I should say the bark of this tree ended up getting burned not too long after it shipped over there. So not a ton of money was made from it. Now I say ironically, because when you strip the bark away from the tree, you're removing the tree of pretty much all of its defenses. It's just like the skin on your body. If you don't have your skin, you're going to die from something, right? Could be disease, could be a variety of things. For these trees, we don't know what exactly killed the mother of the forest, but she at very least got very badly burned in 1908 and wasn't able to heal herself because she was you know, already dead. But even if she had just recently had her bark peeled away from her, she would have died from the burn. She is still standing now though. This is a picture I just took a couple weeks ago. And that shows the strength of these trees and how they are able to endure at least some things. Now, one of the things, that they can maybe endure is actually getting a hole cut through the middle of them. So we're gonna zoom ahead a little bit here. These trees were impacted indirectly from the gold rush in terms of people came across them because of the new settlers to the gold rush. The Native Americans here, the Miwok and the Washoe, of course, knew about these trees and they soon had to start interacting with these people who came to see these trees and interact with tourists and kind of get pushed out of the way as well. But eventually tourism is industry ramped up as the gold rush ramped up, more and more people were around here, but there was competition. There's also a giant sequoia grove in Yosemite, and they were drawing in more and more people by cutting a hole through the middle of one of their trees. So you can drive through it using your horse and carriage, you can walk through it. So here, they also cut a hole through a tree. And you can see here, they have a lovely band that's set up right next to it. Now this really damages the tree, but I wanna ask you all, do you think that cutting a hole through the middle of the tree kills the tree? I'm gonna launch the pole here. I want you to say yes or no. I'll give you all another about 30 seconds or so to vote on this one. All right, another 10 seconds. And I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So it's almost an even split. Some people say, yeah, it's still alive. Others say, no way. If you cut a hole through a tree, it's not alive at all. Well, I'm now gonna show you a different tree and we will find out for ourselves if they can still be alive with a giant hole through them. Now, this is a video and I hope that it works. It doesn't always work with my internet, it's not great. So very least hopefully you can see the end result, but we're starting to bond the tree here. This one, it didn't have a hole cut through it, but was burned pretty much all the way through. 
can see through the other side. And as we go on up here, it's run by other trees. But if you look at the very top here, you can see it has its own growth. This is all its own growth. So this tree, it's called the chimney tree, it's found in our south grove, is still alive with a hole all the way through it, going this way, and actually a hole that goes all the way through to the top. If you go into the middle of the tree, you can see the sky. So the tree I showed you before, it's called the pioneer's cabin tree. It was actually still alive after a hole was carved through it, but it was weakened. A tree can survive without its middle. Its middle is called the heartwood. That's only, I say in quotes, really there for structural support. It'll help to keep the tree upright, which is incredibly important, right? Because that's how the tree can survive, is being upright with its needles collecting the sun. But it can survive for some time as long as there isn't a massive wind event or rain or anything like that. And that's what happened Pioneer Cabin Tree. Maybe some of you remember walking through that tree six years ago or so. I say six years ago because eventually, whether it's because the hole was cut through it or because it was just kind of weakened on its own, it fell over about five and a half years ago. It just couldn't handle it anymore. So this is maybe a tree that was directly impacted by people coming to the area, people coming for tourism because of the gold rush partially, or it might have just fallen over on its own account. We'll never know entirely for sure. But it's very likely we at least had a small impact on the tree. So this is all really bad, right? We talked about over hunting. We talked about poisoning the water. I've told you about these really cool giant sequoias that were messed with partially for tourism. But not everybody was okay with all these things. This is just kind of the people in power, sometimes the majority that were doing these sorts of things. Other people were upset. So these actions actually sparked movements. They sparked conservation movements. And now Caleb's gonna go ahead and talk a bit about that. That's right, like Lily was saying, all of these actions, the, the water being poisoned, the giant sequoias being cut down on the coastal redwoods started the conservation movements. They can trace their roots back to these events. And not only did the conservation movement start, but the park system started as a result of these actions as well. In 1864, after the devastation of a lot of the giant sequoias, a young California senator named John Connors authored a bill that would be called the Yosemite Valley Grant Act. He was able to get it passed through Congress and Senate. And on June 30th, 1864, President Abraham Lincoln signed that law, which created the first park system in the United States. And it's also why our patches say since 1864, they created California state parks and they were tasked with protecting the Mariposa Grove in what is now Yosemite National Park. Now, over the years, we've gone through some restructuring and then National Park Service was born in the early 1900s through the work of President Roosevelt. And they eventually took over Yosemite National Park. But today we have around 280 state parks in the state of California. And again, we are the oldest park agency in the country. And between the two of our parks, Lily's Park is actually the older. And I think she's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this park was established as a state park in 1931. But conservation efforts started way before that. At one point, this is almost a national park, if you can believe it. It just took some time, it took some money, ironically, you know, got started during the Great Depression, but there were lots of movements to help spark protecting these trees, basically from ourselves. Now, that's an ongoing effort. It's not like, okay, this became a state park, therefore we're all good. We're learning along the way mistakes made that are hurting the trees and hurting the ecosystem overall that's here. Now, one actually in particular that we've realized is, oh shoot, you know, we're using this spot wrong. We have to do something to fix that mistake is the meadow. 
Now I can show you the meadow in terms of like a live stream so I don't have any internet connection over there. But I will show you a picture I took of the meadow this summer. The meadow's technically over this way. If you happen to camp at the North Grove campground, you'll be able to see it. And it's a lovely spot, lots of flowers, lots of animals from you know the insects to the coyotes. Maybe you'll see some bats in the sky if you hang out there. But this meadow wasn't this lush and green back, let's say, in the 1950s. During a majority of the time this park has been a park, the meadow has been used for a wide variety of things. A baseball field, it was used for agriculture, it was a main hub for skiing. And all of that activity on the meadow kind of crushed it down. It impacted the area. And that's not good because this meadow was originally, and now it is today, a big old sponge. When it's working properly, it takes the snow melt and it kind of holds it in during most of the dry season and slowly leaks it out. It helps keep water in this ecosystem. But it wasn't doing that when it was all compacted down because there's no space for water to go anymore. So in the 1990s and all the way through 2000s really, the park did a massive restoration uh, project to bring the meadow back. And now it's healthy. We have a boardwalk on top of it. So you're not gonna crush the meadow by walking on it and you can enjoy all the flowers. So that's just one example of a mistake made in the past through our tourism in this case and realizing that we can fix and make it better. Now, one that's ongoing that we're working on right now to help the giant sequoias and honestly, kind of everybody in the whole world is unfortunately climate change. Now, that's not exactly something from the gold rush per se, but it is something from populations exploding, right? The gold rush definitely contributed to the population exploding in California. When populations expand, more energy is used, and nowadays the energy of choice is fossil fuels. So coal, oil, gas, when you burn those, they put greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, it creates this big old blanket, covers the earth, and it makes it a whole lot hotter. And the giant sequoias, as this lovely one right here is, they're strong. I showed you how the mother of the forest hasn't fallen over yet. And she had her bark stripped away from her back in 1854. But they get stressed out from things just like we do. The heat really stresses them. And they're more susceptible to things now like fire. Their bark is two feet thick. That's the length of my arm. That helps them withstand fire, but the fire is too hot because it's so dry and it's so hot. And a bunch of other mistakes we've done in the past contribute to making the fires worse. They can't survive them anymore. So up to 19% of all giant sequoias have died from fire. And those fires are at least partially because of climate change. And in general, they're just not doing as well in this heat. They're not doing as well in the droughts we've been in and out of for a long time now. And now, climate change is a very overwhelming task. And it's definitely an ongoing one. It's not as simple, right, as the meadow where we can just put lots of money, put a lot of work and time and fix it. But you can do little things to help out with your climate change, right? Maybe you can have less food waste. So you're not having energy go into the system only to come out as trash. You can do things like carpool. You can do very simple things to help out with climate change. And even just talking about like I am now can help. But the, really the point is that we need to re like review our actions both in the present and the past and learn from them and fix from them. And that's actually one of the points of Columbia State Historic Park. That's right. So. I'm going to tell you how we became a park. Now, Columbia became a park in July of 1945, and I'm standing in front of the house of the lady who is largely responsible for Columbia becoming a park, Mrs. McConnell. Now, when they came here, Columbia was kind of run down. It was also at the tail end of the Great Depression, and Mrs. McConnell saw all of these old brick buildings that we have here were just crumbling. And she wanted to preserve it. She believed it was important to preserve this little slice of gold rush history. So she got with the residents of the town and they petitioned Congress, who set up a meeting with then Governor Earl Warren, who told them that if they could raise $50,000, the state would match it and would make Columbia into a state park. Now, it took some doing, but they were able to raise that money. And on July 15th, 1945, 
Governor Earl Warren came up here to the park and he signed the law that turned Columbia into a state park. And I wanna quote part of his speech for his thought process too of why it was important for us to preserve a place like Columbia. And in his words, we need to stimulate the study of history for it is one of the greatest safeguards of democratic government. I see in places as these an exceptional opportunity to help the stimulation of such study. These are scenes and reactions which we want to preserve because they help us understand not only the beginnings of our state, but the human qualities which have made our state what it is today. And they help us understand the forces which must be kept at work if we are to deal adequately with many of our problems just ahead. So I want to thank everybody for coming to this little program. I hope you enjoyed today's video. For more content like this, please hit the like button and subscribe and check out our social media links below.